PACER's Project Launch presents Social Security Disability, Qualifying for Benefits, with the Social Security Administration and Minnesota Disability Determination Services. Our speakers today are Sarah, who is a Work Incentive Coordinator from Social Security Administration, and Sarah, a Medical Relations Officer from Minnesota Disability Determination Services. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sarah Cavallo, um, and I am here representing the Social Security Administration. Um, we also have Sarah Dix here from um, the Disability Determination Services, and we're going to talk to you a little bit about young adults and disability, um, what you need to know. Um, so just a little information about me. Um, I um, have worked for Social Security for close to 22 years, and I'm currently the Area Work Incentives Coordinator. So what I do is I assist people in Minnesota and Wisconsin um, who are already on Social Security benefits that want to return to work. Uh, but in previously to this, you know, I spent 20 years um, mainly in the Social Security program, taking retirement survivors, disability claims. Um, so I've got a broad knowledge of both the initial claims process and um, and uh, uh, the benefits we have available after you're already receiving uh, disability. So uh, what am I gonna cover a little uh, today? Uh, we're gonna talk about how social security defines disability um, because we might define it differently than, than other agencies you might work with. Uh, how substantial gainful activity or SGA, you're gonna hear that a lot, uh, comes into play. Uh, what disability programs uh, we have at social security for young adults. Um, and then Sarah's going to talk a little bit um, about the, the DDS, the Disability Determination Service process, and then you're going to get me back again to talk about um, work incentives. So for those who are already receiving uh, Social Security or SSI, um, what, uh, how can you work after you're already receiving benefits? All right, so how does Social Security define disability? Um, so like I said, this might be different than how the county defines disability, how the VA, your insurance company um, defines disability. I, I always tell people that there's two parts to our definition of disability. First of all, you do have to have a disability that's expected to last more than 12 months or expected to result in death, a terminal condition. So, um, you know, it does have to be um, a lasting disability, right? And um, if you break your leg, I mean, you definitely are disabled, <laughs> but you know, that disability is probably not gonna last more than 12 months. So um, it has to be a disability expected to last more than 12 months. And because of that, you are unable to engage in any kind of substantial gainful activity. Um, so you might have a very defined disability, but if you are able to work above that substantial gainful activity level, um, then you do not meet Social Security's definition of disability. So you need to meet both, um, both things. So um, now what is substantial gainful activity? Um, substantial gainful activity is just used to describe a level of work activity and earnings. And if you're consistently over this work activity, level of work activity and earnings, then you um, you're ineligible for disability benefits. And um, to determine what SGA is, it's simply a dollar amount. Um, so in 2022, because it does change a little bit every year, it typically goes up. Um, uh, if you are averaging more than 1,350 1, gross per month, you are demonstrating SGA. And that is for a non-blind individual. If you are blind, you do get a higher limit. And that is 2,260 gross uh, per month. So remember that's gross, that's what you make, not what you take home, not what you see in your bank account. Um, so um, when we're looking at the different programs for Social Security, um, SSI, uh, Supplemental Security Co Income, will use SGA as um, a measure of work during the initial claims process. So when you first file, uh, they'll look at whether you're uh, working SGA. After that, if you're approved for SSI, there's different uh, ways we measure your work. Uh, SSDI, or Social Security Disability, uses SGA throughout the life of the claim. 
Um, so what are those acronyms that I just, just used, SSI and SSDI? Um, those are the different types of programs we have available at the Social Security Office. Um, so Title II or SSDI is Social Security Disability Insurance. And SSDI provides benefits to disabled or blind persons who are insured by the workers' contributions to social, the Social Security Trust Fund. So typically when we think of Social Security, a lot of people think of retirement. Um, so it's the same contributions, it's just if you become disabled before you're able to reach that retirement age, then we take those same contributions and we pay you a disability benefit. Um, one unique thing about SSDI is that um, often there is also a dependent benefit payable if you qualify for SSDI. So this could be a minor child benefit. So in addition to your disability benefit, um, and it doesn't take away from your disability benefit at all. In addition to that benefit, a minor child could receive a benefit, a spouse dependent on their age. Um, and uh, more importantly to this conversation that we're having, um, a disabled adult child could receive as a dependent um, on an SSDI record. Um, if you're eligible for SSDI, then you would also be eligible for Medicare, which is the federal insurance program. Uh, you do have to be on SSDI benefits for 24 months or two years before you qualify for Medicare. Um, also at the Social Security Office, you will find Title 16 or SSI, Supplemental Security Income. And SSI makes cash uh, assistance payments to the aged, blind, um, and disabled persons, and that includes ch disabled children um, who have limited income and resources. And that's the key there, limited income and resources. Uh, SSI is not funded by your social security contributions. It's um, funded by um, general tax revenue. Um, so the types of SSI benefits are available are children's benefits, uh, basically from birth to age 18, uh, adult benefits um, from 18 to 65, and there's also an aged benefit. So you don't have to show disability, you just have to be over 65 uh, if you have that limited income and resources. If you qualify for SSI, then um, you most likely will also qualify for Medicaid, which is the um, state run insurance program. We're going to, I'm going to touch on the SSDI program, but we're mainly going to talk about the SSI program um, because that's where a lot of our young adults are um, as far as qualifying for, for benefits. Um, so um, requirements for getting SSI. So in addition to being disabled, not working SGA, you also have to have limited income and resources. Um, so your income would include any money that you receive from wages, social security benefits, pensions, VA benefits. Um, if you're married, that in can include a spouse's income. Um, and it can also include things such as food and shelter that you receive from a, a, another person. Um, resources uh, are things that you own, such as real estate, bank accounts, cash, stocks, bonds. The resource limit is $2,000 for an individual. Uh, so your resources have to be under that amount. So you are allowed to own a car and have a home. So um, those would not count towards the resource limit. Uh, if you have multiple cars or multiple real estates, uh, that would, would then count towards that $2,000 limit. You also have to live in the United States or one of its territories in order to qualify for SSI. Um, and then we also look at, do you live with someone? Do they provide you uh, with things such as food and shelter? I mentioned that. Do you live in an institution or do you live in uh, boarding care? So you might still be eligible for SSI, but you might be eligible for a reduced amount in any of these uh, situations. SSI determinations for our young adults turning 18. Uh, there's a couple different scenarios. Um, maybe you uh, are um, the child of parents with limited income and resources, so you qualified for SSI as a disabled child. Um, so when you are a child, we do take into account your parents' income. 
Um, so if you're already receiving as a child, then at, at age 18, you have to have a new determination based on adult criteria because there's different definitions for disability for children versus adults. Um, you don't have to contact the Social Security office for this redetermination. They will contact you. Um, they'll either call you and set up an appointment or send you some forms in the mail. Uh, just make sure you show up for that appointment or you um, complete those forms and send them back in or the SSI benefit will stop. Um, so maybe you've never applied for SSI before, either because your, your diagnosis is new or maybe your parents did have um, to, uh, they were over the income and resource limits, so you didn't qualify for the SSI children's benefit. In that case, at age 18, you can apply for SSI because you are now an adult. Uh, you'll be evaluated under the adult criteria, and we no longer will count the income and resources of your parents because you are an adult. Um, it, though, if the child continues to live with their parents um, and does not pay for food and shelter, uh, the SSI payment will be lowered. So, you know, if you file for SSI and you say, um, you know, if I get this benefit, I'm going to, you know, pay my parents for my food and shelter, then you most likely would qualify for that, um, that larger benefit. But if you don't, um, then your SSI benefit will be cut by, I believe it's approximately a third. Um, and you can file that SSI application um, as early as the day of your 18th birthday. SSDI benefits for young adults. There's a couple different options. Um, first of all, you could qualify on your own earnings record. If you have had the opportunity to work a bit um, and you have made those contributions to the social security system, you could potentially qualify for an SSDI benefit on your own earnings record. It's not likely at age 18, but it comes up occasionally. Um, and, and you have to have, um, you don't have to have as much work to qualify when you're younger. Um, so that's a benefit, an SSDI benefit available. The more likely benefit, um, for our young adults is a childhood disability benefit. Um, and that means that your parent is disabled, retired, or deceased and uh, receiving some sort of social uh, security benefit if they're disabled or retired and you are a child that is disabled before the age of 22. Um, sometimes in these instances, you might have received as a minor child as well, uh, but at 18, that minor child benefit ends, and if you are disabled, we need to get a disability determination uh, to see if we can continue those benefits um, as a, a disabled adult child. So you do have to have a parent receiving or deceased you have to not be married and you have to be disabled before age 22 to qualify that for that. And of course, for all of these, you have to not be working SGA. So how do you apply for benefits? Um, a couple different ways. Um, you can apply online um, at ssa.gov and, and uh, fill out the forms there. Um, now, if you're looking to apply for SSI and you've applied before, this won't be an option for you. Um, so most people uh, in this group would probably need to call and make an appointment. Um, so I've got our 800 number right there. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the status of our offices. Um, so for Two years now, our employees have been remote, working from home, but still serving the public through online services and uh, through the phone. Um, so our employees are starting to transition back into the offices and offices will probably be open for walk-in traffic for people to come in and see us uh, in the near future. Um, but with that, we're not going to be able to serve people the way we used to. If you ever came to a Social Security office before, you know, you would come in and we would see you for whatever we needed to see you um, that same day. Um, but now you're going to come in and if it's something that we can do right there, we will. But uh, if it's something longer, like a disability interview, I mean, you can come in, but we'll probably still make you an appointment to come back at a later date. Um, so I would just go ahead. Uh, if you need to file, I would call and just make that appointment up front. Uh, if you qualify to file online, you certainly can, can do that. So 
if you're if you do have that appointment scheduled what should you have ready for your appointment oh i also wanted to touch on one other thing about appointments because um also due to limited resources uh most offices their appointments are pretty far out um but that is not something to worry about it's march right if you called today and made your appointment um, and they could not get you in until later your application would have considered uh, would be considered to have started the day you called and made that appointment so even if it takes a little while to get you in for the appointment uh, whatever day you call and make that appointment that's the day we start your application um, so what should you have ready there's no real forms you have to complete beforehand we do all the forms with you um, during your your phone appointment if that's how you're going to do that um, or you know you could also have this information available before you went online to file um, or if you uh, are receiving an SSI child's benefit, you know you're gonna get that call or those forms in the mail uh, for the adult determination, you can start thinking about all this information. Just get a piece of notebook paper, start writing it all down. Um, so we want you to have names, addresses, approximate dates of all the clinics you've been to in the last um, year, probably maybe two. Um, you don't need to go back really much further than that. Uh, we need a list of your current medications, um, uh, jobs held in the last 15 years, if that's applicable to you, um, and of course your school information if you have an IEP. Um, what do I apply for? Do I apply for SSI or SSDI? Um, so it's not really a, a choice, and we screen for both programs whenever you have an appointment. Um, but if you, there is any entitlement to an SSDI program, you have to apply for that program before you apply for SSI. So this could be, you know, if you are entitled to a, a minor child benefit and now we need to do a disabled adult child, you need to apply for that first. If there's anything additional available to you on SSI, we'll do both applications. Um, for our young adults turning 18, this is the usual trajectory. Um, at this age, usually it's SSI only. Um, there isn't an SSDI benefit available. Um, so we take the application, we, um, you could be approved for SSI, and if that's the case, then a couple things happen. Um, you take advantage of our work incentives. And so you're able to work and um, you become insured you pay those contributions into the social security system and now you qualify for an SSDI benefit on your own record. Or as the years go on, um, parents become disabled, parents retire or parents pass away. And now you are eligible for uh, that disabled adult child benefit or the childhood disability benefit. Um, so um, then when that happens, you will need to file for the SSDI benefit. And so if you know you qualify, you can call and you can take charge of that. But usually what happens is you're required to have reviews on SSI every so often, and they find that information during the review process, and then they refer you to um, the SSDI program to file. And again, you have to file for the, if you qualify, uh, because you're insured on your own or you uh, are eligible for that uh, childhood disability benefit, you have to apply for it or your SSI will stop. Okay, that's all for me right now. So I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah. To, so we've taken all the information, right? We've taken all the medical information. And now what we do is we send it on to the disability division and they're the ones that uh, take the next step. So I'll leave it to you. Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, so I'm Sarah D. Um, I am a medical relations officer with Disability Determination Services. We are actually a state program, um, but we do all federal work. As Sarah was saying, we are making the medical decision as to whether or not someone's going to qualify for these benefits. Um, so just real quickly to tie up, reiterate what Sarah was just saying, we work with both programs, SSDI and SSI. SSDI being the program that is um, related to earnings and work activity or the work activity of a parent who's become retired, deceased, or disabled. And SSI being, <clears throat> excuse me, being uh, benefits for people who have limited income and resources. When we get the claim, it doesn't really matter whether you are making an application for SSDI, SSI, or both. 
whenever we receive the application or applications, the medical requirements and the evaluation process is pretty much the same. There are a few technical details that we worry about, um, such as like the earliest date that you're able to receive the payment, but the overall process is really similar and that's what I'm gonna get into now. Whenever the field office has finished the application information, they make sure everything is complete, no more questions, and then they transfer the case to my office at DDS. Then the claim is assigned to an examiner. The examiner is usually the same person from beginning to end of the life of the claim in our office. And that examiner is gonna to get to know the applicant really, really well through medical and vocational evidence. We first send out medical records requests to all the doctors, hospitals, and clinics that you listed on your application. We're also gonna send out two forms, <clears throat> excuse me. One is a function report or activities of daily living form. It is a like eight or nine page worksheet that asks about the things that the disabled person does in their day-to-day -day, day -day life. So there are questions like, do you cook? Do you clean? Do you socialize? How often do you do this? For how long? Things of that nature. It's really important to us. Um, so whenever you do send in an application, be on the lookout for that form to come through. The other is a work history report. Um, of course, for a lot of young adults, work history is not really relevant. Um, we do go back 15 years, so if you're looking at the form, no need to feel overwhelmed. Um, if we have sent this to you, we think that there must be some work activity in your past that hit that SGA level, so that earnings of around um, $1,350 per month. I will admit we are humans too. We make mistakes. So if you receive a work history report and the young adult who's applying does not have work history or any earnings would be well below SGA, give our office a call. Let us know that the form um, isn't relevant and we will move on. Um, other things that we collect include collateral information from schools, from work or vocational services and other third parties as we need them. As we collect evidence, we're looking for a few key factors. We always want information that's recent. Um, so as Sarah was saying, we request records going back about a year before the date of your application or whenever you became disabled. Um, a lot of times people will try to send us records from 10, 15 years ago, or maybe from um, for an adult child, uh, you know, when, when the child was like 10 or 12, and those are less relevant to us. We want to figure out what is going on with the person and their impairment right now. We also want records that are relevant to the uh, alleged impairments, the things that you're putting on your application that prevent you from being able to work. So ideally, we want um, records from a provider who has expertise or specializes in a certain area. So if you have a mental health concern, ideally, we want to see records from some sort of mental health practitioner. And then we also want records to be consistent, and that should be both across sources. So whatever Dr. A says more or less lines up with Dr. B. And those doctors' uh, conclusions more or less line up with what the applicant is saying in terms of what's going on and how severe it is. We also want records that are very current. So I mentioned we'll go back about a year usually, um, and we will continue requesting records throughout the life of the claim um, up until even the point that we're making the decision. Um, we typically do not make decisions unless we have evidence from the past about three to six months. So that's something that we're always looking for. And then finally, we need to know that your diagnosis has come from what we call an acceptable medical source or AMS. Um, the AMS has to do some sort of test or give reasoning for whatever diagnosis they're applying. AMS sources include doctors, psychologists, nurse practitioners, physicians, assistants, and others. Um, and they are acceptable not because they're better or provide any certain kind of record. It's just that the licensing and credentialing information is more consistent across the country. So whether you're in Minnesota or Ohio or Arizona, um, the background of the doctor is probably fairly similar. The non-AMS sources are in fact very acceptable. Um, we do want records from non-AMS sources like therapists, counselors, social workers, school personnel, et cetera. 
Um, these providers typically give excellent information and they provide um, critical and valuable information that we can't otherwise get sometimes. Especially um, for some of these sources, like a social worker or a counselor, the client goes in to see that person pretty often every week or even multiple times a week. So that social worker or counselor or whoever is probably going to understand the applicant, their condition and what they're going through better than, say, a psychiatrist who only sees the person once or twice a year for med management. So whatever kind of source we have, we want the information, but it's just one of those fun social security quirks that we have to have an AMS provider somewhere in the claim documenting the diagnoses. If you do not have this information, it is not a problem, don't worry. Um, a lot of people are only seen by non-AMS providers. Um, people do not have insurance. Uh, I know during the pandemic, personally, I have not really gone to the doctor a whole lot. Um, so if that is the case, no problem, we will figure it out. What we will do is we'll order a consultative exam or CE, which is a one-time appointment that we schedule to fill any holes or inconsistencies in our file evidence. Um, we have doctors, psychologists, speech pathologists, um, eye doctors, ear doctors, all sorts of things across the state. Um, and we'll use those practitioners to sort of, you know, again, do a one-time appointment. We're filling in any blanks and answering any questions we have. The exam is free of charge. It is scheduled by DDS. Um, we do as much as we can to make sure that the appointment is nearby and accessible. Um, so basically the applicant's only responsibility is getting to the exam, getting there on time, and making sure that when they're in the exam, they're trying their hardest to do whatever the, the doctor or psychologist is asking of them. I will note, as I said, we do um, try to keep our, our consultative exam panel, the doctors who work with us, available in most parts of the state. But if you live especially far north, um, some areas kind of in the southwest region of the state, our panelists are fewer and further between. Um, that can result in having to travel to this exam. DDS does not do anything to arrange transportation. That is the responsibility of the applicant. However, if we are asking you to travel um, more than 50 miles one way to get to the consultative exam, we will reimburse travel costs after we receive the report from the doctor. And you will get a check in the mail um, for whatever the IRS mileage rate is. So again, um, if you get a letter asking you to attend, um, it is just so that we can collect more information. We take care of the bill. All you have to do is get there. Once we have all of our evidence in file, we have collected the medical records, we have received the forms that we sent out, the um, activities of daily living form, we've got our consultative exam, everything is collected, um, organized, summarized, annotated by the examiner. Like I said, they really get to know the claim inside and out. Once that happens, they share the case with a state agency medical consultant who is a doctor or psychologist who works in our office, and that provider reviews all of the evidence and writes medical assessments. They are taking the information and looking at how severe the impairment is and what limitations the person has due to their impairment. And with that information, they write what's called an RFC, which is for residual functional capacity. And that is an assessment that says, what are you able to do despite the fact that you have these impairments? After that, the case goes back to the examiner. They will typically perform a vocational assessment, trying to figure out if the person would potentially be able to adjust to some sort of work. That typically depends on whatever is included in your RFC assessment, your age, level of education, past work, and any transferable skills that you have, you have developed. Finally, the examiner um, completes the decision. They send the case back to the field office, and the field office will then um, alert the claimant. Sarah will get into what happens after a decision in a little bit more detail, but I do want to note that um, in case a claim is denied, there are multiple levels of appeal that are available. If you receive a denial and you say, nope, there is no way that I am able to work, we want to, we want to know that you disagree with the decision. We will start at DDS by taking your reconsideration. 
your case is going to be assigned to a new examiner, new doctor. We go through all of the initial level information from when we first had the claim, check for anything um, that might have been missing. You have the opportunity to correct any information. And then if there have been any um, changes to your condition, any new updates in terms of providers or sources, we'll make sure that those are available too. Um, it is important to consider uh, appealing your decision if denied. Um, you are eligible to receive back pay to that earliest date that you started your application in some instances. Um, as Sarah said, the first day that you call and say, I'd like to start a disability claim, that gets locked in and you'd be eligible for back pay um, throughout the level of um, processing time while we're working on your denial. I will note that about 11 to 12 percent of claims are changed from a denial to an approval, so it is definitely worthwhile um, sending in the appeal if your case is denied. You can continue appealing up through um, higher levels after a reconsideration at DDS. Uh, you have the opportunity to go before a judge in a hearing. Um, you can technically take it all the way up to the Supreme Court, um, but most people stop at the hearings level and then maybe start a new application. You are always welcome to file an application um, for whatever reason, whenever you want, and we will just process it the same every time and figure out, you know, at level we know that you're not disabled or at what level we can prove that you are. Whenever we're doing that, we are always using a process called sequential evaluation. It is a five-step process. We use it in every adult claim to help guide our decision and analysis for figuring out, does this person qualify for benefits? Um, Sarah mentioned the social security definition of disability. It's got the components that you have to have a medical or physical impairment. You have to be unable to work and it has to be long lasting. So we will use these five steps to say whether or not um, the person has proven that they meet those criteria. We always start at step one, asking if the person is working SGA. Again, that is a dollar amount that changes every year with the economy. In 2022, it's $1,350. If you are working and earning more than that, we are going to deny the claim. But if you're not working or you're working but earning less than that, we move on to step two. At step two, we ask, does the person have a severe impairment? Social Security thinks about severity in terms of functional limitations. If your condition is pretty well managed by um, taking daily medication, maybe you put on a pair of glasses, that's unlikely to be severe. But if you have to think about how or when or where you're going to participate in certain daily activities, or maybe you can't do something at all, that is indicative of a severe impairment. And we move on to step three. This is sort of on the last slide where the doctor comes in, figuring out our level of severity and writing um, what the person is able to do. We are asking, does the impairment meet or equal the listings? Um, I will talk about listings in a little bit more detail in just a moment, but basically the listings are specific criteria according to Social Security that demonstrate you are clearly medically disabled. There is no expectation you would be able to work with your impairments. If that's the case, if the doctors reviewed everything and says this person meets that criteria, we approve and we don't have to go on to step four and five. However, most people do not qualify at step three. Um, again, the listings are indicative of extremely severe impairments, um, so it's ultimately a good thing. Um, but whenever we do not approve at step three, that's when we write that RFC, residual functional capacity, the assessment of what you're able to do despite your impairments. So we write RFCs for both physical and mental conditions. Um, examples for what might be on a physical RFC are in a typical eight hour workday, how many hours would you be able to stand or sit or walk? Um, can you lift and carry objects? If yes, can it be 10 pounds, 20 pounds, 50 pounds? Um, examples for mental would include items like, um, how long are you able to focus on a task? Can you reliably interact appropriately with the general public? If given a set of instructions, can you follow one or two steps, three or four steps, or more than that? Once we have that RFC is when we go into the vocational analysis, 
At step four, we ask, is the person able to adjust to work they already have experience with? Um, so for a lot of young people, there isn't significant work experience, and we can gloss over that and move on to step five, where we're asking, does the impairment allow for any other type of work? Social security really does mean any other type of work. Um, if it is something that exists and the person in theory is able to do that for 40 hours a week at minimum wage, the person will not be found disabled. Unfortunately, Social Security does not really care if we identify a job that the applicant likes or would want to do, if the job pays as much as they would like to earn, or if it's necessarily locally available, as long as the job exists in quote unquote significant numbers across the national economy. If we identify some job somewhere that in theory we think you can do, you are denied. However, if we're unable to identify that job that you can uh, reliably do for the 40 hours in the standard American work week, we will approve your claim for medical benefits. So I mentioned on the uh, prior slide and with the doctors doing their assessment, we're checking for severity and the listings are something that we utilize to help determine whether or not someone meets the criteria that are so severe that they prevent work for adults. Um, if you Google SSA Blue Book, you will find this page right away. Um, I have the link on the slide as well. But basically, um, it is a guide. Before the internet, it was a book that was blue and the name just stuck. Um, but it outlines all of the different body systems and specific impairments within each that we um, evaluate. So I'm sure for some of you, this is very tiny, but if you can look on here, I have the adult listings and the childhood listings. There are 14 different body systems. Um, we have musculoskeletal, uh, neurological, mental, cancer, et cetera. And within each body system are the lists of the impairments and the specific criteria that we use the, to determine someone's disabled, the specific evidence that we're looking for. And in some cases, um, we can also indicate how long we'll consider the person disabled. I definitely recommend um, checking out the listings if you or a family member are going to apply or if you're assisting someone with their application because they are very beneficial for understanding how Social Security thinks about various impairments and making sure that you're prepared for what kind of evidence that we might need. Like I said, if something is missing from the file, we do our best to obtain that through a consultative exam, um, but it might also help you understand you know, why we're asking for that exam or that specific test at the exam. Um, as I mentioned, and I think Sarah said too, the uh, criteria for adults and children is slightly different. Um, so again, I recommend checking through them just to look for some of those differences. Um, I have an example here of the autism listing, which happens to be the same for adults and children. Um, on the left, you can see how Social Security is um, defining autism spectrum disorders. And then on the right, we have the actual criteria that we need documented in file to prove that the person is disabled. So Social Security is framing ASD as a dis disorders characterized by um, deficits in social interaction and communication skills. Um, there are repetitive and stereotyped patterns of behavior. There may be loss of acquired skills. Symptoms and signs may include um, abnormalities or unevenness in cognitive development, unusual responses to sensory stimuli and behavioral difficulties. So we're looking at that big picture and to prove that someone is disabled, we need evidence that clearly shows documentation of both deficits in verbal communication, nonverbal communication and social interaction and significantly restricted repetitive patterns of behavior, interests or activities. And then on top of that, we have to have functional information that demonstrates extreme limitation in one or marked limitation of two in understanding, remembering, or applying information, interacting with others, concentrating, persisting, or maintaining pace, or adapting or managing oneself. 
so again, there are a lot of different ways that we're looking at this. This is a particularly complex listing. Some of them are fairly straightforward. Um, Down syndrome, for example, uh, the diagnosis does not exactly meet the listing, but it's pretty close. Um, there are a few where having the diagnosis meets the listing and others where there's, you know, five, six, seven bullet points that have to be met before we can prove that the person is disabled. Um, Sarah has also alluded to this. Um, if a child is already on benefits, we do have to review them whenever they turn 18 to, to check if the person still medically qualifies under adult criteria versus child criteria. Um, we will know uh, when the child turns 18 and reach out to you to make sure that we're filing that new application. Um, if someone is disqualified based on um, medically no longer meeting the criteria, there are vocational and educational programs that can continue the benefit payments over time. Sarah's gonna talk about that, but just keep that in mind for something to look forward to. And then finally, um, keep in mind that Social Security no longer counts the income assets and resources of the parents. So a lot of young people who have disabilities are denied as children because their family's resources are above that um, set amount set by SSI. As an adult individual, um, the young adult is able to have $2,000 available in resources to them. I don't know about you, when I was 18, I did not have $2,000 available. So it makes um, the SSI program available to a lot more people as soon as they do turn 18. I'm gonna change gears just a little bit here. Um, I told you how we make our decisions, what goes into the process, and I wanna tell you what you can do to make sure that the application is effective and when we're reviewing it at DDS that we've got all the information we need to make sure we're processing quickly as well. Um, it seems common sense, but you would not believe the number of claims where this comes up as an issue. We do need to know the full and alternate names of the claimant. So if your uh, child goes by a nickname, maybe he's Bobby, but legally he's Robert, um, marriage, divorce, adoption, gender affirmation changes, make sure that we know so that we and any clinics that we're requesting records from can easily identify the claimant. If you have guardianship over the young adult, make sure that you send in the guardianship papers with the application. It can cause weeks or even months of delay um, if guardianship is an issue and we don't have those papers and we might not even know about them because um, it can take a long time to entangle, identify who the guardian is, get those papers in the file, upload them, save them in the file, request records, it goes on and on. So making sure that if that is relevant to you, it is included with the application. Make sure that you um, let us know where the young adult has been in school. And if you have special ed evaluations and or an IEP, please send them in with your application. School records are incredibly valuable. We look at them up until about age 25. Um, and it can be very difficult in some cases to get records if the uh, student has graduated if it is the summer because schools are closed. And then of course, teachers and school staff are very busy. Um, sometimes it can be a lot of work to chase down these records. I will say for Minneapolis right now, there is the strike. So there are a lot of uh, out, outside factors that influence our ability to get school information. But as I said, it is just a treasure trove resource um, for us that we, we really rely on heavily for young adults. Include any highly relevant medical records. If you have done IQ, psychological, neuropsychological testing, send it in. Other specialized records are helpful like genetic reports, oncology labs, things like that. Um, there are a few reasons for this. The most interesting to you, I am sure, is that sometimes we can pay benefits early. Um, for SSI claims, if we receive information early on that indicates the case is very likely to be approved at the end of the process, we'll actually start payments before we've formally finalized the decision. Um, so that can mean money in your pocket weeks and months sooner. Um, if we do not make the correct decision, it does not have to be paid back, but it gets you six months worth of payments early if we're able to demonstrate with evidence that we think that at the end of the process, it will be an approval. 
It also is just generally helpful to us at DDS. It gives us sort of a um, path looking forward for what kind of case we're working with, what kind of information will be available. And it also often uncovers hidden information. Um, a lot of people leave off their primary care doctor on their application and only tell us about specialists. Um, or it might include some information about a, an impairment that was not included on the application, but is relevant to us. We also want to know functional information. Um, I think I've talked about function, function, function throughout. It is really important to us to know how the person operates day to day. Providers like PCAs, arms workers, teachers, daycare or after school care workers are really valuable in explaining what um, the person is capable of, where they have limitations. And if you are able to identify the um, workers or the organizations that they come to you through, that is definitely very helpful to us. And then finally, um, making sure that we're aware of any language needs or interpreters that we can provide. Um, for someone who is over 18, unless there's guardianship paper in file, we do have to talk to the applicant themselves, the claimant. Um, so I know for a lot of young adults, that's really scary. You don't want to hear, hi, I'm Sarah, I'm calling from the government. You don't want to talk to me. Um, but if mom or dad is going to be involved with the case and mom or dad or the claimant does not speak um, English or prefers a different language, let us know. Um, we'll make sure there's an interpreter on the phone and available at any CEs if we need them. We just need to know what, what to set up. And then a few other things that you can do to actively help us while we're reviewing your claim. Make sure we're kept up to date about any changes. Um, first and foremost, contact information. Um, a lot of people are itinerant, moving from house to house. Maybe you're joining a group home, maybe you're um, in some sort of residential treatment, that is fine. We just need to know how to contact you. We also like to know a, a reliable third party who we can also reach out to for assistance with the claim if we're not able to contact the claimant directly. We do need to know about any medical updates. If you go see a new doctor, um, have a new diagnosis, you're doing some sort of special test or exam, let us know. Uh, we don't find out about these things unless you tell us, um, but we, as I said, continually collect information throughout the life of the claim to make sure that we're making a fully educated decision. I also ask if you are um, supporting someone who is applying that you assist the claimant in completing the necessary forms. Again, we send out that activities of daily living form, the one that asks like, do you cook, do you clean? Please go into detail. The more information we have, the more valuable it is to us and the better insight we have um, for what's going on and what your function and limitations are. I will note that this form is extremely important that you uh, return it to our office. Not having this form um, in file can be considered failure to cooperate or not participating in your own claim. It leads to insufficient evidence, which leads to a denial. Um, so it is a really big deal. Um, if you live with a young adult who loves to snatch the mail, um, but might not be able to open it or respond to it appropriately, please keep an eye out. Let our office know if you think you should see that form and you haven't, because um, again, it's really, really important. We do ask um, if you think that the claimant themselves, the disabled person themselves is not able to uh, complete the form or maybe they don't have very good insight into their conditions and might not give um, fully accurate responses, please help. Um, you can either request what's called a CADL, collateral ADL form from our office, which is basically the same form um, but sent to a third party or you can add additional comments. You can either write right on the form, um, hey, this is Sarah's mom and I think X, Y, Z, or you can attach pages with additional comments. Um, we are truly just gluttons for information. The more that we get, the happier we are. Um, so if you are able to assist and make sure that activities of daily living form is very complete, it is appreciated. Finally, anything you can do to help with CEs in terms of co coordinating transportation, um, explaining how important it is to attend and try your best, those are very valuable um, to us as, as someone who's supporting an applicant. 
And then of course, um, as I said, we set up the exam. We do not necessarily know your whole entire schedule. So if there's an issue where you're unable to attend, let us know. Um, if you are on vacation, if you are sick, if your car has broken down, these are all relevant reasons that we might uh, need to reschedule your exam. In general, we want the same goal as you. We want a correctly determined claim to be done as correctly and efficiently accurately as possible and that works best when there is communication going back and forth. Um, do respond promptly um, to any questions we have of you. Um, I will note that typically we send, first we make a phone call. If we can't reach the person, we then send out a letter. So keep an eye on your voicemail and on your uh, physical mailbox because we do need those um, responses promptly. Typically, we allow 10 days for any explanations to questions. Um, if you miss a consultative exam, you have 10 days to tell us why, things like that. And again, if we do not hear from you, we're not able to contact you because you've moved but not shared your new phone number or address, um, these are reasons to close your claim out. So do make sure that you're communicating with our office. I am going to hand things back to Sarah, who is going to talk about what happens whenever uh, the decision is finalized from DDS. Okay, thank you. So um, DDS has made their decision then, and they send it back to the Social Security office, and then you'll get a letter. Um, if approved, that letter will show your benefit amount. Uh, when the payments will start, and uh, most importantly, it will share your reporting responsibilities. Things like, again, if you change your address, direct deposit, if you go to work, we need to know about that. Um, if you uh, change living arrangements, you were living with one person, now you're living with another person. Um, if not approved, then you have those appeal rights. And as Sarah said, it's very, if you feel the decision is wrong, it's very important to uh, appeal. You only have 60 days to do that, either to ask for the reconsideration or um, the, um, the administrative law judge hearing. Um, but um, by appealing it, it protects that, that original date you filed. So it's better to appeal it than to just start over and file a new claim. Thank you for watching. And a special thanks to Sarah of Minnesota Disability Determination Services and Sarah of the Social Security Administration. PACER Center is here to help. Contact us at transition at pacer.org or pacer at pacer.org or call us at 952-838-9000 or look more at our resources at pacercenter.org slash transition.